So I'm continuing this story of uh, <coughs> C in P2, K, non-singular, <coughs> algebraic, uh, cubic, cubic curve. <coughs> So I'm going to take C to be given by an equation, and I'm just going to write the same equation. So this is a homogeneous polynomial. Of degree 3. In X, Y, Z. So uh, I explained in previous lectures, so, so I have in, in mind that the curve looks something like this. So um, I explained in the previous lecture how you can think about the curve C intersect a line. So let me sort of draw it. It looks like this. Right, and so the way to think about this is take this L to be P1 of u and v. <clears throat> and think of uh, x, y, z. So, so when, when I do this p1 in p2, I've got the homogeneous coordinates of p2. If I restrict them to the line, equals these are linear forms in u and v. Of course, I could choose the equation of the line, for example, to be z equals ax plus by or something like this, and just and then u and v could be x and y. So I can always choose u and v to be either x or y or x and z or y and z. But uh, it has basically no advantage. Right? And then I do, when, I do, when I do C3 restricted to L, this is a cubic form in uv. Hom homogeneous cubic form in... Uh, so the word form here usually means uh, homogeneous polynomial. <clears throat> so I have in mind that when I take the intersection of a line with a, the with a cubic curve, I'm going to get three points. So geometrically, our L intersect C should be three points, and it really is three points, uh, it is three points counted with multiplicity, uh, provide if k is algebraically closed. Right. So I'm working over a field, I'm working over a certain field, and I said, you know, my prime, my main example of a field is the complex number field. And so that's algebraically closed. <clears throat> so I've already explained all of this. So there's the sort of, um, there are, there, um, there's the main case where I've drawn there, which is three distinct points. And then there are the special cases where I get uh, two, uh, so uh, one double point plus a distinct root, distinct point. So, so this would be, for example, P1 plus P plus Q plus R, and this one might be 2P plus R, 2P plus Q, and uh, as you can see, an even more special case is one triple point. So uh, this means 3P. <coughs> And uh, so this case, uh, so this is a flex inflection point. 
case. So um, uh, we're, we're especially interested in this for several different reasons. We're especially interested in this third case for several different reasons. So, uh, so example, and later on we'll see this is not just an example, but this is, uh, this is the general, this is every, every curve can be written in this normal form. So this is via stress. normal form so if my curve is uh, y squared z equals x cubed plus a x uh, z squared plus b z cubed right where a and b are some elements in the field k Okay, then uh, the line z equals zero has uh, an inflection point at um, zero one zero. So this is uh, so this is letter O. Right, so uh, yeah, this is three times point O. <clears throat> okay, so let me draw this picture and explain what inflection means. So this is the picture I have. So I'm really thinking of the complex numbers here, and I'm really thinking of uh, uh, using. Uh, local analytic functions, but the, the, the picture makes sense in any case. So this word inflection point, according to dictionary, is, uh, <coughs> if, I'm not, if I'm not wrong. So, uh, uh, I can even I can write the Chinese characters if you want to. It's the place where the curvature changes from being curvature downwards to being curvature upwards. Yeah. So why do I say the why do I say the curve looks like this? So I'm at this point. So set uh, y equals one, and uh, you know x prime equals x over y and z primed equals z over y. Okay, so uh, the equation then, so I'm going to just set y equals 1. Then I'm getting z equals x cubed plus a uh, x z squared plus b z cubed. Right, and so, uh, you know, let's, uh, if you want to, you can call this or z primed equals x primed cubed plus etc. <coughs> right? So, so I told you there is this game which is going from a homogeneous polynomial to an inhomogeneous polynomial. So formally speaking, I should do things like this. And uh, I end up with an equation here, z primed equals x prime cubed plus some junk. Right? But informally, we can just write this. Right? And so what does this look like? Well, if we were solving this as an, uh, if we were solving, if we look at this equation, it's not z equals a function of x. It's z equals some polynomial with involving x and z. So it's really an implicit equation for z. But the implicit function theorem says, that the differential of this, this equation with respect to z is non-zero. In fact, it's just one. Right? And therefore, I can write z as an analytic function of x using this equation. And then, what is it? Well, it's z is x cubed plus, and then this z squared here, if I, if I thought of it in terms of power series, would be terms of higher order than three. 
So, so, so this is Z, Z is X cubed plus higher order terms. Right. So I'm, uh, I'm, I said implicit function theorem. I'm not really using it in any technical way. I'm just using it to, as, as intuition to justify this picture. Right, so there's, uh, there's a, there's a, my picture, this is my picture and inflection point. Okay? However, my definition of an inflection point is this. So I take a line there, I restrict the curve to it, that's taking a polynomial polynomial in x, y, and z, and just write, substituting x, y, z list linear forms in u and v, and then I, taking this homogeneous cubic form in, 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 in u and v, and assuming it has a triple root. So this is purely algebraic. This doesn't need any analysis or implicit function theorem or anything. This is just, uh, this is a perfectly clean, simple, purely algebraic definition. All right? And so this is, a, this is my picture of what it looks like. Yes? So, uh, I want to take this idea a bit further. So, let, let, me, let me say, so normal form. The word normal form means that, so if we're working in projective space, This is this vector space, K3, minus the origin, and then divided out by some equivalence relation. And here, there's a big group, GL3K, a group of projective coordinate transformations. So you remember when I was talking about the conic, conics in the plane, when I was talking about quadratic equations in the plane, I took a homogeneous quadratic form Q of X, Y, Z, and I said, well, I know how to change coordinates to make that into some particularly nice form. And so that's the, uh, that, the, sa that's the same idea here. So this is a lemma. Assume assume that C is non-singular. I'm not going to explain what this is in any great detail, but you've seen, you've seen examples already. Assume C is non-singular and uh, P and O in C is an inflection point. Uh, with tangent uh, with line L inflectional line L. Right? So assume, in other words, the thing I'm assuming is this. Then uh, there exist coordinates. Uh, I'm also assuming here that the characteristic of the field K is not equal to 2 or 3. So characteristic two or characteristic three are very interesting, but the, it, they're much more complicated to explain. So then there exists a coordinate change so that uh, C is of this form. Right. So I'm assuming that C and P2 is a non-singular cubic. So I'm assuming I'm assuming this. And I say, suppose that in addition I've got this line L, then I can change the coordinates so that so, so that my uh, equation is like this. And so this is a, this is just an exercise in understanding uh, how to think about these conditions here 
these conditions of having double lines, double, double roots and triple roots. So exercise in coordinate geometry. Okay. So first of all, let's assume that assume that my point O is the point zero one zero. Right. So I've got a point in projective space. I can certainly change the coordinates so that the point is zero one zero. Assume that. Assume that the line L is as z equals zero. Right. So so far I've got a point and a line, and I say I can say that this is zero one zero and this is z equals zero. Right. Then. Uh, the condition that the condition that uh, zero is in C is C three of zero one zero equals zero. So this means, i.e., the coefficient of uh, y cubed in C3 is zero. Right? And then I'm going to make I'm going to take the condition that uh, L uh, that C, C C restricted to L has a double root double root or more at O is uh, so well, let me let me just leave a blank there and we'll come back to it in, in a minute uh, i.e. the coefficient of x y squared is zero in C three is zero. Right, and then the condition that that C restricted to L has a triple root at zero is so something else here, i.e. the coefficient of x squared y in C3 is zero. Okay. So, so when I when I just when I when, when I, I wrote this li line down, I just threw it at the, threw it on the blackboard. If you hadn't seen it before, you don't know why I'm doing it. But anyway, I I, I having done this, I say uh, I look at the line z equals zero. So when you set z equals zero, all the terms disappear, and you're just left with x cubed. So x cubed e equals zero is an equation we know how to solve perfectly well, and it's just three times the point. Right? And I'm just saying the, the opposite here. The fact that there is no term, there's no term x, y squared here, means that when I set z equals zero, I'm going to get something which has only x cubed in it. Right? So, so So uh, you know we're going to I'm going to continue talking about this for a minute or two. So let me write out C3 is homogeneous cubic in X Y Z. So therefore, it's a linear combination of, right, now I write x cubed, x squared y, x y squared, y cubed, and then the guys involving z, x squared z, x y z, 
said y uh, sorry y squared z then x z squared y z squared then uh, z cubed right <coughs> so you might remember that when I did the same the same uh, I wrote down the same thing for the quadratic I also wrote this in this form. So, uh, you know, these monomials, it, that, it's not just a list of monomials. The monomials actually have some kind of geometric property themselves. So this, uh, this picture that I'm drawing here is an example of a Newton polygon. And we'll, see, we'll probably see other examples of it uh, uh, later. Right? So, what I'm saying is that, uh, uh, so, so uh, the point uh, O is the point zero, 0,1,0, zero, right? I ask you, when does this, so imagine that I'm, I've written names of coefficients here, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, right? Then the condition that this point should belong to the curve so the condition zero in C, right, it just says I'm going to take this polynomial and I'm going to evaluate it on this point. Right, so when I do, for example, x, y squared on this point, well, I've got an x in there, so it's zero. So the only term that survives, if and only if, this is the coefficient of uh, y cubed equals zero. So that's the thing I wrote over there. So you see, I'm going to say first this guy is zero, then this guy is zero, then this guy is zero, and the result is, the result is that every term there is divisible by z, except for this guy, right? And so that's exactly what happened here. And if the original original thing I wrote down, if you set z equals zero, then those terms vanish, and the thing you're left with is x cubed. Right. So what does it mean for x, y squared equals zero? So let's sort of think near the point zero, one, zero. I can write C, C3 is, so I'm going to set y equals one. Right. This is harmless. This is just, the, this is just taking a slice of the equivalence relation. It's a standard trick. So it's exactly the trick I was doing here. Right, so I set y equals 1, then c3 is, so, you know, for example, alpha xy squared plus beta zy squared. And oh, y is equal to 1, so I don't need to write that down. So it's a linear form. Right? And this alpha and beta, alpha is uh, df by dx. at, evaluated at the point O. Yes? So, uh, I said non-singular, and I'm going to come back, at, back to this later in, the, later in the course in much more detail, but I want there to be a well-defined tangent line at this point, and that means I want either alpha or beta is, non, is, is non-zero. So, either alpha or beta is non-zero. Right, so, so what am I saying here? This can, if I'm saying that this coefficient of x is zero, it means the tangent line to the, uh, to the curve is just given by z equals zero. So that's the thing I should have written here. Right, the condition that c restrict to l has a double root at zero is that uh, the tangent is that L is the tangent line to C at zero. And that means the same thing as saying that DF by DX evaluated at uh, uh, whatever it is, the point O is zero. Right? So in other words, I can pick these, these terms out I can just choose these terms out by saying, well, I've got a polynomial, and that's the coefficient of this term. Or I can say, differentiate with respect to x, set y equals 1, 
and I, I pull out this term, set, uh, set, sorry, set x, y, z to be 0, 1, 0, and then I just put, put, pick out this term automatically. Right? And then, so the flex term is the same. It's saying, um, so, uh, you know, there'll be a, the coefficient of, the coefficient of x squared y is d f by d x squared d, d 2 f d 2 f partial second partial derivative d 2 f by d x squared evaluated at the point O. Uh, so you know up to a half but I, I'm assuming the characteristic is not zero. Right? So the condition to have this triple root, the condition to have this triple root is expressed in terms of a first derivative is zero and a second derivative is zero. So when you did first year calculus, you were to told that this, this guy here, so if, if I'm at a maximum or a minimum, then I have to have the, uh, I have to have the uh, derivative zero so that's this condition. It's the, just the condition that the curve is locally horizontal at this point. Right? And then what is it that distinguishes a maximum and a min minimum? Well, a maximum is where the second derivative is negative, and a, 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 a minimum is where the second derivative is positive. And if neither of those things happen, it means I've got a flex point. I've got one of these places where the curvature changes from going up to going down, to go from going up, from being curved downwards to being curved upwards, right? So, so this, uh, this calculus here, I mean, you know, if I want to set z equals zero and see only x cubed here, then it's obvious I've got to set these three guys equal zero, right? However, these also have this kind of intuitive ge geometric uh, interpretation. So what do I want to do next? So, uh, so this is uh, d to f by dx squared at zero. <coughs> so of course I mean I mean this and this and this. It's uh, So I'm trying to prove this lemma. So to prove the lemma, uh, so I'm, I've already done most of the work. Uh, assume, assume that L uh, intersect C is 3 times the point O, where the, the, sa the same notation. Z is 0, and this is the point 0, 1, 0. <coughs> right, then what are we going to do with this equation? Well, what do we, the, the point about this equation, the point about this equation is that it's quadratic in Y. So then the equation is quadratic in Y. Uh, so it looks like Y squared Z plus Y Z squared, uh, sorry, plus X, X1. So, sorry, let me, let me put in some coefficients here. Uh, let me put in, let me choose the coefficient here to be 1. And let me, uh, you know, I don't know, what, what, what should I call these? Uh, I already had alpha and beta. Let me call these gamma and delta.
Well, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to get rid of them in a while anyway. So this is now uh, uh, cubic in x, z. Yeah, so, so we're almost finished. We're almost finished. So, so now uh, we do this trick of completing the square. Right. So in other words, I'm going to make, so I told you, well, I'm working up to this group of projective coordinate transformations. Right? So, so far, the only way I've used this group is to choose, is to make this choice. Right? So now I'm going to do y maps to y primed equals y plus one half of, uh, what, what, what am I supposed to do? Uh, take out the y, uh, a half of So I want to think of this as a quadratic in, quadratic in y. So I can take the z outside. Anyway, this is, uh, let, let me not explain it, just do it. So this is a half gamma x plus a half delta z. Right, then the equation is now, the equation is now Uh, y primed squared times z equals cubic in, in xz. Yes? So, uh, t take this equation, t take this left-hand side of the equation, just take the z out of it. Now, what I'm seeing is y squared, which is quadratic in y, plus uh, y times z plus x times y. So both of those are linear in y. So I can just suck them into the square by, doing, by making this change, change of coordinates. Yes? And the cubic in, uh, the cubic in x and z, uh, it's uh, x cubed plus, uh, you know, and then some, some other stupid term. Uh, so I don't know, psi times uh, x. Z, x squared z plus uh, x z cubed plus z cubed. And I can get, likewise get rid of this term here by x maps to x primed equals x plus one third of psi. Right, so, so that's completely, uh, you notice, notice that the, the coordinate changes I'm making here are linear linear changes of coordinates, and they're linear coordinates of ch uh, change of coordinates that do not change the coordinates of O or the equation of the line L. Right? And so this is, uh, this proves, this proves the lemma. Right? So, <coughs> so I said this is an example, but actually this is the normal form. So, uh, uh, you know, this, this, this equation, exa exactly this equation, or the same equation with z set equal 1, is used in uh, uh, really thousands of places in number theory as the uh, typical elliptic curve. So, so let me uh, let me say let me uh, yes okay. So from now on, uh, I assume 
that C is uh, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, or y squared z plus equals x cubed plus ax. So, so there is actually a little assumption here. It's not true that every plane curve over every field automatically has an inflection point. I'm assuming, if you assume, yeah, the, if you assume that the field we're working over is uh, algebraically closed and characteristic not two or three, then you get the result. <coughs> uh, the inflection points on, on a cubic curve are interesting for lots of reasons, and I may say one or two of them later. Uh, but uh, it, we don't get them for free. You have to do a little bit of work, and I'm not doing the work. I'm assuming it. <coughs> so I want to, I want to uh, moreover, uh, I can factor... the right hand side as so assuming uh, if uh, as x into x minus 1 into x minus lambda again uh, so assuming assume k algebraically closed and allow coordinate change Okay. So, the thing that's on the right-hand side here is a cubic polynomial in the affine, when I write it in the affine way, it's, a homogene, it's an inhomogeneous cubic polynomial in one variable x. In the uh, homogeneous case, it's a homogeneous cubic in two variables x and z, and it has three roots. And I'm assuming, I'm assuming that these three roots are distinct. I'm assuming the three roots are distinct, and that's because I'm assuming the curve is non-singular. I explained yesterday that, uh, I explained on uh, Tuesday, that if C, if, if this thing has two, has repeated root, then I get one of my, uh, I get one of my friends like this. <coughs> right, this is the uh, alternative case, and I'm, uh, these are singular, and I'll, I want to work only with a non-singular case here. Right, so I claim, now I'm going to claim that, uh, so, so this is a theorem, and it's uh, a theorem that's going to take me the, the, the whole of the next lecture to prove. Theorem. Uh, C is y squared. Let, let me let me let me just write the affine form x into x minus one into x minus lambda. Then there do not exist. There does not exist any partially rational map. So rational means partially defined. Um, let, me, let me explain what a rational map is after I've said it. From, uh, from A1 into C, which is not constant. Not exist any rational map uh, not constant. Sorry, this is not grammatical, but uh, any non-constant rational map A to C. <coughs> so this is A1 over, over a field C, 
and this is the curve C, I'm thinking of it is in A2C, A2K. So I have to say what rational map is. So rational map is partially defined a map uh, given by t maps to x of t, y of t, with x of t, y and t rational functions. So, so you know, just just to remind you, uh, when I was talking about uh, you know x squared plus y squared equals one in a two over a field k, then I can write this as x is uh, I think it's something like two t two lambda over one minus one plus lambda squared y equals uh, one plus one minus lambda squared over one plus lambda squared or something like this. And then this is, uh, as lambda moves, this moves around this curve, right? Uh, so over the complex numbers, it runs into a little infinity when lambda is plus or minus i, right? But it's still running around this curve, right? So that's a rational parameterization. And the statement I'm making here is a little bit stronger. There doesn't exist any constant, any, there doesn't exist any non-constant rational map from A1 to C. So, uh, uh, I'm assuming here rational maps are, rash, are maps given by uh, quotients of polynomials. So anyway, the, uh, it's, it's perhaps easier to, to start off on the proof. It's a proof, and the proof comes down to, uh, so, you know, important starting point, k of t is a, U, a UFD. I explained this at the beginning of last time. Polynomial ring in one variable is a unique factorization domain. Right, and, the, and the, so the x, x of t, y of t, are contained in the, in k of, k of round brackets t, which is the uh, field, of, field of fractions. So I thought about this a bit, and I really can't, I really can't think of any proof, any way of say, expressing this, which is neater or clearer than uh, than what's or the, what I wrote in the textbook uh, um, about 30 years ago, 20 years ago, anyway. So suppose I write x is r of t over s of t, and y is p of t over q of t. Right, where well, these are polynomials, I can write these as polynomials. So all of these guys, r, s, p, q, are polynomials. in T, right? And why do I make this fuss about unique factorization? 
So I want to say, I, can, I want to be able to say that R and S here and P and Q have no common factors. K of T have no common factors. So what, what, what the argument comes down to is we're going to look at, we're going to look at y squared equals x into x minus 1 into x minus lambda. Right? And then I'm going to write, uh, this is uh, p over q squared equals r over s. R over S minus 1, R over S minus lambda. Yeah, here I need, of course, that lambda is not equal to 0. <coughs> um, right, and I'm just going to, let's multiply through. So, how do I clear denominators? So I, uh, on the left hand, on the on the left on the right hand side, I can see three copies of S, right? And on the left hand side, I can see two copies of Q. Multiply by Q squared S cubed, right? So what do we get? I'm going to get P squared S cubed equals. Uh, so. Q. Now the Q is not going to cancel anything, so there's going to be Q squared there. And then I've multiplied each of these terms. Each of these terms gets multiplied through by one copy of S. So there's R, then there's R minus S, and there's R minus lambda S. Okay. So uh, I remind you. Uh, these guys, P, Q, R, and S, are contained in this guy, K of T. And uh, K of T is a unique factorization domain. And I've arranged that R of S and P, Q <coughs> So, so, you know, all the terms are co-prime. All the terms here are co-prime. Yeah? So, um, more precisely, this S here, S divides the left-hand side, obviously, and therefore S must divide the right-hand side. But S certainly does not divide any of these terms. So S doesn't S co-prime to R means I think it means that S cubed has to divide Q squared. And, um, you know, Q, uh, the, uh, Q, Q is co-prime to P. And therefore, same argument. The Q, the Q has got to divide, the Q divides the right-hand side, and therefore the Q divides the left-hand side. On the other hand, the Q is co-prime to this P. So therefore, Q squared divides S cubed. Right, and um, you know, uh, just you, this is just the usual rules of working in a u unique factorization domain. Therefore, uh, therefore, uh, so it's probably best if I follow the notes.
Hey, this is really good. I'm think I'm, uh, I think I've already got my notation upside down. It doesn't matter. Anyway, therefore, s cubed equals a times q squared with a uh, in k a non-zero uh, a, a in k with a an invertible element of k a invertible. Okay, so what am I saying here? So I'm in a unique factorization domain. I've got that uh, s cubed divides q squared and the q squared divides s cubed. Right? And that means that the two guys are equal, except possibly for a, a, a factor which is a unit. Right? The units, the units of kt, if I've got a polynomial ring and he's a unit, then this is equal to k multiplicative. So the only, the only polynomials that are invertible in the polynomial ring are the non-zero constant polynomials. Okay, so So, so, sorry, this is just a little, you know, technical glitch. Uh, I'm going to write this uh, R squared cube, cubed equals S squared P into P minus Q into P minus lambda Q. Right, and um, so, uh, sorry, sorry if I'm messing up your notes as well as my own, but uh, uh, so here I'm writing... Uh, I think I'm writing x is p over q and y is r over s. Uh, anyway, so the, con the, con the conclusion from this is, um, so uh, let me, let me so as I said, this is s squared equals a q cubed with uh, a in case k multiplicative. Right, and this means that uh, a times q is equal to s over q all squared. So S over Q is a polynomial and, and that. Okay? And then, and then uh, so, you know, I mean, I've sort of been talking about these two terms. Right? But basically the same thing happens if I look at this R and this P. Right, so the, I'm sorry, I've been, what am I doing? S and Q, R and P. I'm going to, now, now I'm going to think about the R and the P. So, so this guy, R squared here, divides the product of these three terms. And these three terms on the right here, P, P minus Q, and P minus lambda Q, are co-prime, right? So P and Q are co-prime. P and Q have no common factors. And so therefore also P and P minus Q and P and P minus lambda Q have no common factors. 
Right? So I have a product of three guys, each of which... So imagine, imagine that I've got P factorized into, factorized into uh, its irreducible components. But suppose that P is factored as a product of primes. Now I've got a product of primes here, another product of primes here, another product of primes here. The whole thing is a square. Right? And I'm not allowed to have common factors in there. So similarly, BP... So... So R squared... Uh, so uh, it's the same A here. I can write R squared equals A times P times P minus Q times P minus lambda Q. And the only way this is possible is if P is... Um, So taking 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 the the highest ta taking the common factors uh, of uh, common factors of R and P R and P minus Q and R and P minus lambda Q, right? We, di we discover that uh, that so, so this guy is a square. So any 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 prime factor, any any irreducible factor that appears in this R R R, R has to appear in R squared twice, right? So it's going to divide one of these three terms. And these three terms don't have any common factors at all. So any, any irreducible factor here appears here twice. It's got to appear over there twice as well. And it can only appear separately in each of the three terms. So the conclusion from this... So, uh, the conclusion is that also, uh, for, some, for some scalars in K star, uh, B times and I'm talking about P, B times P, and C times P minus Q, and D times P minus, P minus lambda Q are perfect squares. In K of T. So you know, this argument is uh, what, we're, what we're doing is factorization in a, in, a, in a ring which we know is a unique factorization domain. So the, the common, the one that, the, com the unique factorization domain that everybody knows is the ring of integers. If we were working with integers here, you'd have no, you'd, you'd sort of see that all, all of these things as being very obvious. Right. <coughs> So, so the thing I had there is that Q, uh, A times Q, so in other words, I have P and Q in K of T, co prime. And such that the four linear the four linear combinations f 
four different, four distinct linear combinations are perfect squares. in KFT. Right, so I claim, I claim then P and Q are constant. So, so I hope that, you know, I mean, that what I'm saying here is uh, exactly what's written in the textbook. So, there's, uh, you know, if you're not following immediately at the, as I said, at the blackboard, then just read the textbook because it's the same, the same argument. So, I'm, I'm really, I really want to see this as a geometric statement that this curve here, so I'm talking about, uh, after the reduction steps I made, this is almost the same thing as a completely general non-singular cubic curve in the plane. I can write it in this, and that's just a choice of normal form. Then having got this, there's no non-constant map from the line in one variable to, to this curve defined by our rational functions. Right. And the proof is, as, as you're seeing, the proof involves this arithmetic in this particular unique factorization domain. Right? So you just do, do all of these kind of arithmetic steps. <coughs> assume I could do it, then I'd have x is p over q and y is r over s. I can assume these are co-prime and so on, and then I can just multiply out the de clear denominators here. Now I have an equation saying a product of lots of guys is a product of lots of guys. And I'm in a unique factorization domain, and so therefore all the terms on the left have to divide all the terms on the right. And furthermore, the arguments I'm giving here are saying that, for example, the factors that are in R can d have, to, have to divide one of these terms and then they have to divide him with, with power 2, because it's r squared on the left. And it's not allowed to divide two of these. OK? So um, I'm getting to this. Let me, uh, so um, uh, I should leave it to next time. Uh, right. So. Is there any problems with the homework I gave out last week and uh, last time? The, the problems for homework. 